All right, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded. Um, if you do not consent to being recorded, you are asked to drop off the meeting at this time. I'll give everyone just a couple of seconds in case. Um, all right, uh, well, my name is Darby Gallagher and I'm a member of the Miami Tribe of Oklahoma, as well as a project coordinator for the National Indian Health Board. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this Ask Me Anything event today. Um, and our conversation today will focus on social media and the role it plays in spreading COVID-19 misinformation. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with AMAs, there are a time where you are able to ask a subject matter expert any question you may have about a certain topic. Since today's focus is specifically on social media and misinformation, we will limit questions to that topic only. Um, if you have any recommendations for other AMA projects you'd like to see in the future, please feel free to type them in the chat box or the Q&A box um, or send me an email at dgallagher at, at nihb.com. I went ahead and put my email in the chat box right now. Um, you can go ahead and get started. Today, I would like to introduce our subject matter experts. Uh, we have Chairperson Aaron Payment from the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Um, and then we have our group from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Tribal Support Section. Um, and they will all be answering your questions during today's AMA. Um, I will now go ahead and turn it over to Chairman Payment for some brief, brief remarks and to introduce himself. Would you like to take uh, it away? All right. So um, we hope to be joined also by Dr. Jill Jim. Uh, she's easily one of the smartest people I know. Um, so I'm hoping she'll be able to join us. Um, and so my my script here says that I got 10 minutes. So and we do have time. So I, I want to kind of give a little orientation um, to, uh, you know, the pandemic and the impact in Indian communities and then give you a sense of my community and how we might be interpreting uh, as Indian people, uh, you know, the different media messaging and and, um, you know, our attempt as a society to get through this public health uh, crisis. And so, um, again, my name, uh, so let me back up. Ani Buju Biwakajig Indishnakas. Uh, my name is Aaron Payment. My spirit name is Biwakajig. I'm the chairperson of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Uh, we are the largest tribe east of the Mississippi. Uh, we have about 50,000 members. Um, and I like to share that we have one third, one third, one third. One third of our members live in our health service delivery area. Um, one third live in lower Michigan. And then one third live all across the country. Um, and so that's important because when we talk about messaging, we know that for some tribes, when you have large populations dispersed, that the recipients um, were not homogeneous. We have different um, uh, views and understanding. And um, also I wanna address real quick that there are data limitations on the data that is collected. Um, I'm very grateful for IHS and the delivery of the vaccines and the, before that the testing. Um, I'm grateful for the inclusion and oversampling of American Indians uh, uh, during the creation of the vaccine. Uh, that was very important. Uh, often we were left out because of our small numbers, uh, but they oversampled at our recommendations. So I'm grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> I also want to call to your attention the health disparities that are uh, documented in the Broken Promises Report. That's the U.S. Civil Rights Commission report. And it, it shows that we persist as American Indians in having the worst of the worst statistical outcomes across the spectrum. And what that means is we are the most susceptible and the highly susceptible uh, to the pandemic uh, for getting sick. Um, the data that is reported it is very glowing and our vaccination rates is very glowing, but that data is limited to the service area. It does not include uh, population data from outside of the service area. And in, in Michigan, I just wanna give you a quick example. When the pandemic first hit, um, the, so the unit of measurement uh, in data uh, is the county health departments generally for states, right? And states, the state of Michigan, we have a good relationship with the governor, but initially they were not counting American Indians. We were counted under other. And so, um, so for the two thirds of my members who don't live in our service area, there was no data being collected at all. And there continues to be no data collected because while we were successful in getting the governor to ask for American Indian, um, they're not collecting tribal specific data. So if you'd asked the Navajo president 
um, how are you doing? Um, they would be able to tell you in their geography, but for the members in Washington, DC or all across the country, like other tribes were limited. So I also wanna say, uh, I wanted to give you that demographic picture because we're not monolithic. Um, Indian people are ideologically probably microcosms of the communities in which we live. Um, we live in a very rural community. We live in a Bible Belt community, um, a very red community politically. And so our, our people, we do have a distinct culture and different beliefs culturally, but for a lot of political views, it, it's pretty consistent with the communities in which we live. And so, um, and because of that, uh, we have a lot of probably 50-50 on Trump voters and, and people who follow sort of what the, the former president was putting out in terms of don't get vaccinated, it's gonna blow over, it's not a big deal. We'll wake up one day and it'll all be gone. The weather will warm up and the, the pandemic will be over with. And add to that um, forced assimilation, add to that uh, coordinated by the federal government, uh, introduction of smallpox. Um, and that's in our memory, that's in our oral tradition, we know not to trust government for a reason. And, and because of that, Indian people are very leery of, of federal government. They're leery of their own governments. Um, also in the 1960s, uh, there was a practice of sterilizing American Indian women in order for them to qualify for scholarships. And there was a red list. So the red list was any American Indians that were involved in any kind of uh, politics or, or uh, activism to try to promote treaties and, and sovereignty. And so Indians have a distrust of government and it's not a conspiracy if it's true, right? Um, so we have reason to be suspicious. And I wanted to share all of that with you because our communities are ripe for manipulation. They're ripe for messaging that can get us off of what's, what's in our best interest for public health concerns. And so we are no different than the rest of the population when it comes to that. And in some cases, we might even be more susceptible to negative messaging uh, that's put out through social media to urge us not to do what's in our best interest, which is to protect ourselves and protect our, our loved ones and our fellow tribal members. So I was hoping that that would kind of give you a context uh, for when we get into the Q&A. Also trying to stretch out to give some time for Dr. Jim to show up. Miigwech. Thank you so much for that chairman payment. Um, and then I will go ahead and turn it over to CDC. Jay, if you wanna go, go first or Kira. Uh, sure, I'll, this is Jay from CDC. Why don't I jump in first? Cause I was gonna give everyone an overview of our overall social media strategy at CDC and talk a little bit about um, where our attempts to address misinformation fit into that. So. Um, I'll just bring up my uh, slide deck here. Give me one second to get that going. Okay, and can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, great. Well, um, it's great to be with everybody today. Uh, my name is Jay Dempsey. I'm the uh, social media team lead um, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and I've been working um, over the past two years with uh, the, the team of people that are working to use social media to get vital information about COVID-19 um, and all of the related topics um, to COVID-19 out in the social media space. So um, again, looking forward to talking with you today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of <clears throat> a very high level overview of CDC's overall social media strategy, um, which essentially means uh, we are um, creating engaging content, featuring actionable messaging, um, and tailoring those messages for um, intended audiences, um, and, and as well as the, the profiles that we um, develop that content for, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any of the other profiles that um, we try to use to get that information into the public space. So we tend to consider that there are um, five basic rules for uh, social media success. And the first one is that um, so much, in fact, the majority of content um, is consumed on a mobile device like a phone or a tablet. And so we try to um, ensure that any of our content that we're developing is gonna be um, <clears throat> easily read or um, consumed on a mobile device, whether it's text, whether it's video, um, we're just checking to make sure that it's going to work well on a mobile device um, as opposed to what it would look like on a desktop. Um, 
we, we're always thinking that you have basically one second to catch your audience's attention. And so we're thinking that, you know, most of us tend to scroll quickly through a social media news feed. So we, we try to develop content that makes the, our audience members stop scrolling and engaging with that content. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the, the key things we always encourage other social media content developers to think of. Um, rule number three is be engaging. Uh, you know, that means tell a story if that works, show empathy, um, acknowledge difficult circumstances, be human, surprising and funny where that is appropriate. And um, we try to keep this in mind often you know, at, at CDC. We're, we're very science focused. We have a lot of science-based information to share, but we are we're trying to synthesize that information um, and adapt it in a way so that it is engaging for the audiences that we're trying to reach. Um, rule number four is uh, know your audiences. We, we're trying to think about who our intended audience or audiences are um, and if social media is in fact a realistic way to, to reach them and if it is, which social media platforms are gonna work to reach those audiences. We recognize that some um, audiences, some platforms work better than others. So for example, younger audiences are much more likely to use um, Instagram or uh, Snapchat as opposed to Facebook. You know, some of the um, older members of our audience might use Facebook daily. And so we're just trying to, like I mentioned earlier, adapt that content um, for which audiences we're trying to reach based on platform. Um, and then find, finally, rule number five, we're trying to figure out which messages uh, resonate. So, um, we conduct uh, things like message testing, review available audience research. Um, and I just you know, encourage you if um, you don't have any of that material to see which ways you can conduct your own to learn what messages might resonate uh, with your intended audiences. And then just showing some of the examples of how we are trying to develop actionable um, social media content that is authentic, answers questions and generates responses um, I've shared a few examples here. Um, you can see on the far left um, side of the screen, we've um, got an example of here of, you know, recognizing that uh, the Omicron variant of the virus that causes COVID-19 was spreading, but we tried to include those action steps that um, we know ways that, that do work to limit the spread of that variant. Um, you know, recognizing that it's a difficult, difficult situation, but outlining those steps that people can take to um, limit the spread. Um, and notice in these, we're, we're not focusing on the negative things like don't gather in a crowd, for example, but rather we're, we're focusing on the things that people know that they can do, such as getting vaccinated, getting the, the boosters when they're eligible, um, wearing a mask in indoor settings, things like that. Um, in the second example, we're sharing some information that helps parents and caregivers know um, exactly what to expect when, for in this example, taking their child for a vaccine appointment. And um, that, that message actually plays through a little animation that um, gives you the five or six key steps to know what to, um, what to expect when you're, when you're taking your child in to get vaccinated. And then the final example, we're answering a question we've seen um, left in uh, the comments section um, on a lot of our social media content. And so um, when we see um, questions and comments that are appearing with some regularity, we try to make just an entirely new set of content out of it. So in, in this case, um, we're seeing this question about getting the, the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time as the vaccines like for flu at the same time, whether or not that's safe. Um, and you know we're building that that same kind of content out of it, so that we're hopefully directly answering that question if we're not able to do it within uh, the comment section itself on the social media channels. Um, <clears throat> collaborating with local trusted messengers can be very beneficial, particularly if you're particularly if you're trying to reach a very targeted and local audience. Um, you may be able to work with uh, local leaders, uh, such as you know, doctors or healthcare professionals. You might have a TV personality or a trusted healthcare provider that might be able to help you carry uh, your audience to your message. Um, and that this can be done in a number of ways. And I've got this one example here of a short video clip that we've used in the past um, that we've uploaded to YouTube as well as part of our um, social media content. I'll just kind of play a really brief clip of it right here.
All right. So, um, you know, collaborating with trusted messengers, plenty of ways to do that. I just uh, wanted to share that video example um, as a really effective way that you might be able to do that in the social space. Um, and I'll pause that really quickly because I had I didn't realize it was going to auto play, but I've got um, I've got three examples here of um, ways that I think you can leverage the creative um, tools that are available in each platform. You know, a lot of social media content has um, so social media platforms have ways that you can just post text, but they, they've also got these really rich capabilities of posting video content um, and a lot of other different things that uh, work really well in the space. And, you know, following up on my previous point, I think you can take advantage of local leaders, local um, healthcare providers uh, that might be trusted in your community to um, participate in some of this type of content um, that can, you know, potentially go a long way and uh, help carrying your message. Um, and so this is, uh, these are examples of the story um, type of content. Uh, this type of content is available um, on platforms like Snapchat, but it's also built into Instagram um, and uh, Facebook as well. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just continue playing that here. You don't have any audio. All right. Um, and then finally, uh, I know misinformation is uh, one of the things that we want to spend some time talking about today. So um, I want to acknowledge that, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a huge challenge in the social media space. Um, it's, it's been, you know, difficult for um, us at CDC to, uh, you know, to, to respond to just knowing that uh, misinformation can spread so quickly um, in the social media space. Um, fortunately, there are some steps that you can take to manage your messaging. Um, the first one is, um, fortunately, most social media companies like Facebook um, and, and Twitter are routinely labeling content now that um, seems false or misleading. Um, some of those, some of that content gets automatically uh, pulled down in the social mm -hmm. space. Um, and then you may notice if you're scrolling through Twitter, for example, you may see um, that some of the content is flagged as potentially false or misleading. And that often includes a link to um, a reliable source of information uh, such as CDC or a local health department. Um, but otherwise, when you're building content, um, you can acknowledge the importance of seeking trusted sources of health information. And so you can, so we've got an example of how um, you can do that here. Um, you know, we, we wanted to acknowledge that, you know, it's certainly daunting to find, um, you know, the, the correct information when so much information is available to us from multiple sources. So this is just our attempt to um, acknowledge that it's difficult to find some of that content. Um, but then we also recommended that, um, or recommend that you can build content based on facts, especially if you're routinely seeing the same types of misinformation um, in your social media comment section or on other profiles. Um, for example, when we see examples of misinformation, we um, we try to counteract that by developing the, the, the correct information into its own standalone content that we will publish across multiple social media channels. Um, and you'll notice here that we, we don't repeat the misinformation that we're seeing um, in, um, in the social media uh, space, but rather we're, we're trying to lead only with uh, the factual content that we want people to remember. So in this example, we're you know, firmly stating that COVID-19 vaccines do not cause uh, variants um, and that the, variant, that the vaccines in fact work to limit the spread of the virus that might cause more variants um, in the first place. And then we've got the link for more information. But generally what you can do um, is monitor those comments um, that appear in your social media space. Um, if you can respond to some of those questions and, and comments um, and you've got the available staff to do so, um, that, is a, that is a great tactic to use. Um, you can also review your social media comment policy. 
Um, and you know, note that if um, if you're seeing information that violates that that policy, such as misinformation or things like um, um, threatening speech or anything like that, that you you know reserve the right to um, hide or report that um, that type of content to uh, the social media platform itself. And there's another um, one we've got there. Um, I wanted to just end on a quick note about evaluation. Um, of course, evaluating your social media content's performance is a key part of any social media strategy. You can measure some quantitative um, items like engagements. Uh, that's the number of you know, followers, um, likes, shares, retweets, things like that. Um, but I also encourage you to think about the more qualitative items like the types of comments you're getting um, and the types of discussion generated by your content. Um, in addition to, of course, um, establishing some performance goals for your content when um, developing your, so your overall social media strategy um, and evaluating it based on um, how it performs against that, um, those, per those established goals. Okay, um, I will look forward to answering some questions during the Q&A and I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you so much, Jay. Uh, Kira, I believe it is your turn. All right, hello everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Sorry, my video isn't working, but. Okay, all right. Is everyone able to see my screen? Sure. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kira Hall. I am a vaccine coordinator on the tribal support section as part of the CDC's agency wide COVID 19 response. And I will be speaking briefly on how to address um, vaccine misinformation on social media. So picking, uh, picking back off of Jay, um, so a lot of the same information, um, but just wanna go ahead. So within your community, um, it is important to make the decision you know, to get vaccinated, visible to others and really celebrate it. And you can use a trusted messenger and other community members um, to speak on the importance of getting vaccinated, um, why they support vaccination, you know, why they receive the vaccine and why it's important to your community. And this can be shared by sharing testimonials around vaccination on different social media platforms. Like Jay mentioned earlier, you have Instagram, they have a stories and reels feature to make those quick videos. Um, TikTok, especially great for the younger generation and um, Facebook posts, and they also have a stories feature. Another strategy is to host talking circles or other spaces where community members can provide input and ask questions. For example, virtual town halls, live Q&A sessions are great ways to offer public health professionals or other trusted messengers the opportunity to engage the public to disseminate vital information and address misinformation. And these virtual meetings can be held through Facebook Live, Zoom, and you know, plenty of other web video platforms. And there's a lot of misinformation um, and disinformation regarding COVID-19 um, vaccines. And as you're likely aware, there's a lot of misinformation about the vaccines circulating all over social media. Um, some ways to address this might be to, you know, work with your communication staff to take questions on workplace social media pages, um, create short videos that share factual information about vaccines and debunking false claims or myths that you see online. And you can share these videos, once again, on the different social media platforms, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, Facebook. And there's also the CDC Insight Report, which is published quarterly. And this report identifies emerging issues of misinformation um, and disinformation and how to address them. And then the next few slides address vaccine confidence and communication resources. 
The first resource I want to uh, speak briefly about is the rapid community assessment. So this guide provides modifiable tools developed for health departments to better understand and address community needs around COVID-19 vaccines, identify trusted messengers, and identify potential solutions um, to increase confidence in uptake. And then also there is the COVID-19 vaccination field guide, which outlines selected strategies to help increase vaccine confidence and uptake. And the field guide also includes examples from communities currently using these strategies. And lastly, arts and cultural engagement can generate community demand um, for COVID-19 vaccines by making vaccination um, an accessible and socially supported choice. So using local artists, um, they can communicate vaccine information in a way that often makes it more understandable, memorable, cultural rele uh, culturally relevant, and actionable. Um, and once again, like these images can also, um, created by the community, can also be shared um, on the different uh, social media platforms. And that is all I have. So thank you so much for your time. Um, please hesitate to reach out um, to my team. Like I said, I'm a vaccine coordinator on the tribal support section. Um, our email box is eocevent509 at cdc.gov that I can drop into the chat. And I look forward to answering any questions during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Kira. Um, and thank you again to all of our panelists um, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I have a few questions that were submitted online um, that we can go ahead and start with. Uh, and once we get through those, we will move on to questions from the audience. Um, and when that time comes, if you would like to speak, we ask that, ask that you click the raise hand button um, and myself or another NIHB staff will unmute you um, and you can ask your question. Um, and if you do choose to share and ask in person, um, we ask that you please start by sharing your name uh, title and tribal affiliation or organization. Um, and once you're unmuted, we also invite you to turn your camera on if you would like so we can see your face while you are speaking. Um, and if you are uncomfortable with asking live um, or feel more comfortable typing it into a Q&A box, um, you feel free to type your question into the Q&A box or the chat box um, and we will get to it. Um, and I will go ahead and start with our first question, which looks like it is a question for everyone. Um, uh, and the first question is, what has been the most common vehicle for misinformation in your communities um, and experience, uh, such as like social media apps or messaging apps um, that, that you have seen in your communities? Um, Chairman Payment, if you want to go first. Yeah, so if I could real quickly just uh, respond, I appreciate um, the depth of the um, information that's being made available for tribes by the CDC. Uh, we have a great respect in our community uh, to the CDC for helping to get uh, relevant information out. Um, if I could just make one little uh, recommendation. Um, so I serve on the HHS Secretary Tribal Advisory. Also, I serve on the NIH Tribal Advisory, the Director's NIH Director's Advisory, um, and also on SAMHSA. And so the one thing is... Um, if you have a very ambitious and sort of uh, uh, progressive sort of uh, community health director or whoever's receiving the information from the CDC and has the initiative and is, is, is programming and putting that out, uh, then the information you're putting out will reach the people. But I would, I would ask that we take a little step back and imagine um, that not all tribes have that capacity. And um, so um, I asked a long, long time ago, if we could help create like models of information from some archetypes. And we wanna be careful not to be stereotypical, um, but helping us to be able to uh, produce those little skits or those little videos or, or putting information out, I think is very helpful. And I wanna share with you, um, cause I'm a sharing type person, I like to share, um, is I did, I'm gonna post in the chat real quickly. I, uh, Nicoa asked me to do a video to promote um, checking on your elders and their public health. Um, you know, they're very, they're the most at risk, um, probably of all citizens across the country because Indians are the most at risk. And then our elders are the most at risk because of their health challenges. Um, but I, I, I put a little video, maybe later if we have time after questions, you, we can watch it. But on, uh, so to, to address your question on the misinformation, 
So um, a lot of our people walk uh, box. Uh, CDC probably can't answer these questions this way, but I can as a tribal leader. Um, and the information that is put out there, and I, do, I really don't understand how we got here as a society. We're pushing out misinformation um, to generate viewers and to try to align with those ideologies. It's almost like an illness, uh, like getting, getting a fix of some kind. Um, and, and so a lot of our people are getting their misinformation um, from Fox uh, News or um, from Facebook. A lot of it is coming through Facebook. Um, those would be the, the main primary. But I would also say that we need to be cognizant that there is an underground network of this information, both in terms of uh, the misinformation on the pandemic, which really kind of ties into that, those different groups that are, that are in a feeding frenzy like QAnon and, and all of those groups. And there's a level of communication that is happening at a level we have never ever seen before, a level of misinformation to promote people that this is some kind kind of, uh, you know, give me, you know that saying, give me liberty or give me death. I'm like, give me liberty and give me life. Why does it have to be liberty or death? Um, it should be our, our right to be able to make, and, make uh, and discern the information. But, you know, I always thought that the increased volume of information would, would increase our intelligence levels, but it, it, it increases just as much information. And, and while we did uh, look at some of the social media platforms that are kind of now, only now, two years into it, starting to put some corrections out, they're still doing it in a very sheepish sort of, um, sort of an enterprise sort of focus rather than putting it out because they're afraid to alienate their, their customers apparently. Um, so anyway, so that's, and, and our people are just as susceptible to those media networks. But uh, the main thing I wanted to get across is there's an undercurrent of communication that's happening that we don't even see. And it's really kind of like terrorism uh, type, type of communication pushing that out. And, and that makes our job even more difficult. Um, and I know the CDC has to be careful about messaging so it doesn't come across as a, in, in a political way, but tribes don't have to be that careful, so. Over and out. Thank you for that, Chairman Payment. Um, I can go ahead and repeat the question, uh, Jay and Kira, if you'd like. Um, what has been the most common vehicle for misinformation in your communities and your experience, such as like social media sites, um, like Chairman Payments have a Facebook or a messaging app, something like that? Hey, well, this is Jay. I can, I feel like somewhat limited in my response because if the, the question was like asking about communities and um, since I'm on behalf of CDC, I'm not working in a specific community, but, um, you know, I will just note that, um, of course, we've seen um, a huge growth of mis and disinformation um, spreading um, just in, in social media in general. I mean, on on our social media and on social media sort of writ large. Um, and, you know, we recognize that it's a huge challenge to respond to. And so um, I'm, I'm glad that some of the social media profiles have begun to take a more proactive approach um, in trying to um, stem the flow of, of that misinformation. Um, uh, and then, you know, hopefully some of the tactics that I've outlined are, are something that can be done at the local level to um, address uh, some of those instances as well, um, and especially some of the resources that Kira shared um, are, are great things that you can share within your public uh, social media spaces to at least have the um, sources for the correct information there um, that people can see. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Kira, how about you? What have you noticed? Uh, yeah, like Jay said, so I'm also, um, you know, on behalf of the CDC, so not really in the community, but as far as working with, um, you know, working closely with some tribal communities, have seen as far as the, like I said, the misinformation, disinformation, and just for myself, just being online, <laughs> um, it's, you know, seeing all that circulating and, you know, just coming, you know, from the people making their reels and, you know, TikTok and things like that, just spreading information, but like I said, I'm glad to see that I have seen some, you know, campaigns as far as, you know, debunking those, you know, myths about the vaccine um, and, you know, videos that I have, you know, seen circulating. So, yeah, so, you know, like Jade said, you know, it is the issue we, you know, we are, you know, we are aware. And so hopefully, um, especially, you know, being, you know, 
on the tribal level, you know, in your community, you have, you know, more of a say as far as kind of, you know, putting that information out there, you know, targeting that, targeting your audience, um, you know, in a way where you don't have to, you know, be so, I guess, politically correct and everything. Right. So you can kind of get straight to the, straight to the point and everything, because you know your community best, but yeah. Yeah, and if I, if I can follow up on that, just, I, I think, particularly within tribal communities, it seems that you have access to the, the concept of trusted messengers, perhaps more so than some of the other um, uh, groups that we, we might target. And I just want to really emphasize what an incredible resource that can be. You know, it's one thing for us as CDC to put out a message, um, but if, if it's coming directly from someone within a local area that is willing to speak truth to a topic, um, but also, you know, talk about why that person chose to, for example, get a vaccine, um, that, that person's message just goes much more, much further than in a, in a trusted capacity than I think, you know, something coming from a, a large national organization might. So I just wanted to reemphasize you know, how important that, that concept of trusted messengers can be. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sorry, I was just talking and kept going. My phone was not on. <laughs> um, uh, so it looks like we do have a question um, in the chat box from Yvonne. Um, they said, we have a very low vaccination rate among our youth and young adults that plateaued when Pfizer became available to 12 to 15 year olds um, at our jurisdiction, any content that we can customize to roll out new targeted efforts? Um, I don't know if, if Jay or Kira or Chairman Payment, if you have any ideas. So this is a very vulnerable group because um, again, for some weird reason that we don't quite understand, I think, I think history books are gonna be written about how we handled uh, ourselves as a society is our, our young people are, while they, they're more resilient, and we know that, um, to catching the, uh, the, the virus, they also, um, you know, when we had the school closures and then the social pressure for sports and then reopening schools and, and how all of that was manipulated and, and politicized, um, they're, they're the most vulnerable because they're, they're in systems. I, my nephew, fortunately, we decided, I'm raising my two nephews, and we decided not to be in the public schools, their virtual education. And um, early on, they were, you know, my, he said, uncle, my, my, my friends in school are scared because nobody's wearing masks and their parents are telling them not to wear them. And even the kids that think it's a smart thing to do, the social pressure, peer pressure of not wearing a mask is very, very strong because they, they, they ought, they're being teased they're being ostracized. Um, and so, while, uh, while we did begin to do the vaccinations for the 12 to 15, I think we've done a pretty good job. And I, uh, I think that we've had uh, vaccination clinics. We've done a good job of that. And also you can get vaccinated directly in our health centers. Um, but the, the area that's still very much at risk is the under 12 year old or the, when the five-year-olds to 12 year olds could get vaccinated. I, I think somehow we kind of thought we were at the end of it. And I don't think we're vaccinating that population at the rate uh, that we should. And I don't know the answer other than, uh, again, targeted messaging on how do we keep our, our next generations um, safe so that they can be our next generations. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I just wanted to add as far as, especially for that um, age group, we have seen that across the board, you know, that kind of, you know, the low risk vaccination rate and, who are really trying to hone in as far as, you know, getting them vaccines. Um, but it's also as far as you got to, you know, target the parents and really kind of get them on board as far as, you know, what their concerns are. Because ultimately, you know, with that age, they're the ones who were um, making that decision for their, you know, take their child to actually, you know, get the vaccine. So, um, but yeah, so just, you know, reaching out to um, the parents, even setting up, um, like I mentioned, even town halls where they can just, you know, you know, present their questions as far as any type of concerns, nothing's off the, you know, nothing's off the board as far as no silly questions, you know, what concerns you have as far as the vaccine for your child and kind of having those trusted messengers where they're able to speak to them and say, you know, hey, I hear, you know, I hear your concerns. So this, you know, to answer your question, you know, these are the facts as far as, you know, about the vaccine and how it can protect your child. 
um, you know, and really, you know, go after the pants that way. They're like, oh, okay, you know, you know, I will, you know, really highly consider or I'm going to go ahead and make that appointment to get my child vaccinated. I don't think I have anything to add to, add to that. <laughs> yeah, those were great. Thank you guys. Um, Aaron, I see your hand is raised. Oh, no, that's from before. No, oh, okay. oh, the other Aaron. Other Aaron. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, Aaron. Hi, how are you? Um, I was just thinking, so Kira's suggestion is, is excellent about reaching out to parents. There's also a, it's called We Are Native, and they have some downloadables, and they have some really nice things for adolescents, both that people could use within their own communities that might be helpful um, or to send out. And those, I think, one was a tick, one's a TikTok, one's an interview with a young adult. And if it is your community, it's like you said, if you have adolescents in your community that, that understand the vaccine or interested in getting the vaccine and are proponents for the vaccine, then sometimes, especially with that 12 to 17 year old group, a peer to peer can be super helpful. So getting one adolescent to talk to another adolescent and explain why they think that the vaccine is important and why they, why they want to get it. And I mean, we actually have some trainings to help young adults talk to other young adults about what it looks like to get the vaccine. So you can, and you can do that with different ages as well. You can have peer-to-peer -peer and, you know, 18 to 35 year olds, if that's an age group that's struggling with getting vaccinated or with those adolescents. You can also have those kind of peer-to-peer -peer counselors, other adolescents that are willing to kind of be proponents for the vaccine or masking. I mean, we've seen it work both with masking and with the vaccine. So that was one of the things I was thinking about that we've seen be pretty successful in, in different communities. Thank you, Erin. And actually, since you mentioned We Are Native, um, Tommy from We Are Native is actually on this call. Ooh, there you go. Uh, and I think we might be able to get them to unmute and tell us a little bit more about what they have been doing. Hey, appreciate it. Appreciate the shout out. Um, and we appreciate the love and uh, great, great resources that I've been hearing on this. Um, so I definitely want to thank the panelists. But yeah, I think um, part of what we've been really doing is, is what's been successful as to us is really asking the youth and young adults. I think a lot of times as health professionals, sometimes we kind of let that slip our mind of, you know, let's try to create the best, um, you know, campaigns, let's try to create the best, you know, messaging when, you know, oftentimes I think that's, you know, can be overlooked. So, you know, we, we put that step first and we, we really try to ask and get the feel of, of what youth and young adults, you know, are, are thinking about how they feel about it, um, what messaging might look like. And of course, I think trying to be relevant, you know, adding pop culture into our messaging. Um, a while back, we did a, we did a messaging series series with Uncle Clean, um, and and we just were like, what if Uncle Clean got shacked up on the res? Like, what would that look like? Um, and so we had some fun with that messaging, and from there, you know, I think the responses were great. And um, what I wrote in the chat as well is is our angle that we've kind of been really you know really thinking about and utilizing is helping youth and young adults make informed decisions. Um, you know, because I don't, I'm not a parent myself, but I know. My mom had a difficult time, you know, raising me as, as a native youth and young adult, but like, you know, we can tell youth to not do this, not do that. But I think the approach that what we're really thinking about is helping them make informed decision, giving them correct facts, giving them correct information, um, and really building that trust to, to become a, a, an honest and trustworthy resource is, is one of the first steps that really work for us. And then from there, you know, Honestly, it, it goes back to like, you know, if you can think into tapping to being a young adult yourself, right? So we've been looking at masks where that was our big step. So we want you to, to wear a mask. Like, would I wear a mask? Of course, I'm going to wear a mask. But if it looks cool, if it looks a lot cooler, if it matches my outfit, I'm just being honest, you know, I'm going to wear that thing all the time. So, you know, just think stuff about like, you know, thinking about it in that sense and, and really asking the youth and again, the young adults, like what? what works for them because if you create a message and it, you know you think it looks cool you you know you don't you know you you have a certain perception about it if you ask a youth or a young adult 
what I love about working with youth and young adults is they're honest. They're bluntly honest. So, you know, they're going to say that's lame. You know, they're going to be like, <laughs> you know, not even relevant. So really listening and, and being and having an open mind about it has been super helpful for us. But thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you for joining. Um, all Can right. we get Tommy to post the, um, the link to the, his site, to that site? Yeah, Tommy, if you don't mind, will you just drop the drop the link to the website in the chat? Um, let's see. Let's move on to our next question. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, it looks like this question is for CDC specifically. Um, when we're scrolling through social media at the end of the day, uh, like if it's me and I'm like scrolling through Twitter at the end of the day, um, what can we do if we come across a piece of misinformation that people are sharing? Um, should we report it to someone? And if so, who? I think we kind of hit on this a little bit in your guys' presentation. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> following up on what I was saying about how the <clears throat> social media platforms are generally taking a more proactive approach, you can flag or report certain comments if you're seeing them as potential uh, misinformation. It may not get pulled down immediately, but it, it sounds like the social media platforms are taking a, a harder look at some of that potentially misleading information and um, might eventually remove it if uh, they, they find it to be false. Um, so that, you know, that's a start. Um, and then, you know, if this is a channel that you or your organization are managing, you know, you, you can also then strategize on ways to either respond directly to that commentary or um, perhaps work on a set of content that directly responds to the misinformation that you might be seeing from multiple sources with uh, the factual information, including links to, you know, verified sources like, like CDC or some of the other um, fact check um, sites that uh, Kira shared in her slide set. Oops. Freaking mute button again, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Kira or Aaron, I don't know if either of you have an answer that is any different. I know it's- I, um, Just real quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, there's a little bit of a disconnect between, and it's just the nature of what we're dealing with with social media, between when we find it and when we send the correction. I do like the way that you put out the, the corrected information without reacting to the, because when you react to it, then, then, you, then you get in an argument about, oh, you know, you're brainwashed. But putting out the correct information, I think is helpful. But you know what, if, if there was somebody doing a meta-analysis of that type of, type of messaging that, that's happening, um, and then maybe could be putting out the corrected information to tribes. We could start posting the corrected information on our, our websites and, and through our different networks. Um, and, and I think we would be willing to do that on a regular basis. Whenever it comes out, just put out the, and, and it would be current because it would be following the trends of the misinformation that we would push out the corrected information. So if, if that were put together someplace that uh, we would put that out. Yeah, um, and thank you for that answer because it kind of leads into my next question for you, um, which is how can tribal leaders combat misinformation in their communities? Um, so if we do a meta-analysis, that's one way. I don't know if you have any ideas for other ways. Um, well, you know, the other thing is as we're talking about the different resources that I didn't even know about, like uh, uh, We Are Native, and I'm, I'm making copies of, of all of the different links as, as they're appearing here and looking through the messages of what different, uh, different people are doing. Um, if that information, you know, remember when you went to the library, when you physically went to a library and they had the, uh, the guide, remember, uh, like on a topic and, and librarians were just wonderful people because they loved putting that stuff together for you. And it was helpful because when you had to go to a card catalog, you had to look it all up manually. But if, if um, that were made available, um, I think that um, we would more likely see it and we would more likely use it. So I, maybe CDC could do an informational push out of the different types of um, links to what, what people are already trying. Yeah. I don't know if that's uh, CDC's job, but I think it would be a good role for the CDC. 
Yeah. Um, and it looks like Tyann just shared um, another resource. Uh, she said it's a website that analyzes misinformation, um, not specific to tribes, but shows what is trending. Um, thank you for sharing that, Tyann. Yeah, you're coming in so clutch with all of these resources today. Um, Aaron, yes. There's all CDC also produces, it's called an insights report that you can get quarterly. And it usually also talks about what the trends are and then how to address those trends out going on in the public. In the tribal support section, actually, we do have a website where we try to post resources specifically adapted for tribes. And then NIHB is also trying to put together a number of resources for tribes so that there's so that's a couple of different, but I, I see your point, Chairman Payment. It's kind of knowing what's out there and then how to access all that information. Because I think that there's a lot of information, but it's kind of discordant right now. Like you can't necessarily go to one place and find because Johns Hopkins also has quite a nice resource catalog for tribes that, I mean, they have downloadables, YouTube videos, and so there's all these different areas. So I think that's a good thought. Maybe on our tribal support section website, maybe we can try to, I'll talk to our policy comms person and see if there's some way that we can put links to other sites as well. And then that way there would maybe be one site that people could go to and access that information. So thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, and somebody just dropped in the library uh, or the uh, John Hopkins one that you were talking about. Okay. And I see the insights report as well. And that's also really nice to read through that periodically and just see what's going on out there in, in people's thoughts and minds. You know, and I wanted to say too, like with that peer-to-peer -peer and what with the we are native, it goes back to what you were saying, distrust of the government. So sometimes, you know, CDC isn't the best messenger for this information, but it, you know, it is people and organizations like We Are Native or NIHB or yourself, you know, if you have a website, posting that information on your own website might be the best resource. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for those. Those are great answers, guys. And again, with all of the resources we're getting in the chat box, this is great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, let me see. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, what is the best approach a tribal health department should take when creating vaccine messaging? Um, and what kind of methods of like getting that information out, disseminating that information, have you found work the best? I'll jump in. Um, if, you, if you get a chance to go back and copy the link on the one that I helped Nicoa do, uh, they they contracted with that with a native uh, a native video digi video group and so they knew what they were doing in the messaging and um, so we had like a conversation and then they crafted up a script and I kept going off script but they kept getting me back on script but um, it's a matter of of having people that they recognize uh, if it's the community members or the other thing in my community is we have a diversity of how we look. And so having dark skin people in it, having light skin people in it, people with blue eyes in it, because we're very diverse, but, um, and, uh, and so having some cultural messaging, because um, in the one that I, I dropped in the thing for the elders, it's a matter of, um, they're the people that are closest to our culture and our language, and they're national treasure, they're our treasures, because when they're gone, the, that is gone. And so uh, we, we, that was included in, in the messaging um, and to make sure that we're looking in on them and protecting them. So it was all steeped very much in our culture. So whatever messaging we're putting out, if we can add that added value to it um, of why it's important for our community to protect our people. You know, we don't have a lot of people um, when you look at the census or compared to everybody else. And so we need everybody that we have. So I, I think that kind of cultural messaging and the critical nature of it, I think it helps to carry the message to people, even hardened people who might be, you know, watching that one TV station. Um, when they hear that message, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, we got to protect our elders. I, I think that does work. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me 
pull the question up one more time so I can ask again. Um, what is the best approach a tribal health department should take when creating vaccine messaging? Uh, and what methods of disseminating that information have you found to work the best? I don't know if Jay, Kira, or Aaron, you guys wanna take a stab at that one. I'll jump in. Um, so just from, um, from what I've you know seen as far as working with some um, tribal communities, it really depends on as far as in your community kind of where they get that information. So one community we spoke with that, um, especially the older population is to a lot of radio. So they would, um, you know, put out information um, through the radio and then also had people, um, with small communities, people going to, you know, going door to door, you know, with flyers um, as far as, you know, you know, information um, on the vaccine. So I think it really boils down, depends on kind of your community and kind of really what, you know, they would take to as far as, you know, you know where they would get their information. You have majority of people on Facebook and it's probably going to, like we said earlier, going to vary by age as far as, you know, most time older population may be on Facebook or they may be listening to the radio. Of course, the younger ones, you know, they're on Instagram, they're on TikTok um, and all those other social media platforms and kind of, you know, you know, using a trusted messenger and able to, you know, disseminate the information that way. Yeah, not, not much to add, but, um, you know, again, I just reiterate, know who your audiences are, um, and then figure out where they're getting your information and adapt your content accordingly, whether that's social or it might be radio, like, like Kira was saying. And then again, trusted messenger, trusted messenger, trusted messenger. <laughs> hey, one of the best ones that I saw that had a national appeal, and I, I see NHB dropped it in here, and Stacy would probably break my arm if I didn't mention it is the act of love um, mask that we had out for a while. That one really went over well in Indian country. Because it's not, you know, all this talk about don't tread on my rights or don't tread on me or whatever. It's like, wait a minute. No, it's, it's you're demonstrating your love for one another and trying to protect each other. So. Exactly. I have been working on that project myself, the act of love project. I do it is a favorite. It always makes me feel nice because instead of like, people going to get their vaccine because they feel like they have to, they're doing it for their community, for their loved ones, for their friends. And I think it's great. Um, those were, looks like Mary shared another, we got oh, so many resources in here. Um, I am out of questions, but I was thinking about showing the PSA that you're oh. in, Chairman oh. Payment. Um, so let me, share my screen thank you uh, and we will get this up for everyone stacy's a member of my tribe so that's why i was saying this should break my arm <laughs> all right can everyone see my screen oh. yes you can see it but there's nothing on it's just black right now oh I think you got to click on you got to click on the link first, pause it, and then go to your screen. Okay, let me. My laptop is frozen. <laughs> uh, I can try and see if I can pull it up. One second. Okay. Man, technology is great when it's great, <laughs> not so much when it isn't. Okay, I also can't do it. Uh, all right, can you give me the ability? I'll, I'll try it. Yes. You should be able to share your screen. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Let's go. Don't do that, please. I have my child here is being, he's being funny. Okay, I think this is it. You're ready to start your own business, to turn that oh, commercials to a paycheck. <laughs> All you need is a partner you can trust. Over the last 20 years, legal zoom. Okay. There it is. As tribal leaders, we know we need to protect our elders, but it isn't always apparent what harms them. During public health emergencies like COVID-19, elder programs may have been impacted. Loneliness and social isolation felt by our elders may have been heightened. The more we are socially connected with our family and community, the less health problems we will have and the longer we will live. 
As tribal leaders, we can also create programs and policies to help our elders and caregivers manage stress and prevent burnout. Be a good relative. Protect our knowledge keepers and help those who care for our elders. Connected together, we will stand strong. The National Indian Council on Aging has resources that can help. For more information on elder isolation or caregiver resources, go to connectedindigenouselders.org. So, um, let's see, stop share. So just one thing to add to it is um, there's, there's, a, there's a step I think that we need between what's available and, and getting those messages out. Services and support that might be me still. I'm sorry. There, yeah. So I, I think there's a there's a little bit of a, a not. I don't want to say to disconnect because the the information that's being made available is very helpful. The promotion of local trusted people is very helpful, but I think it's a matter of helping us a little more with capacity to be able to help get that message out. Because what I just showed you was very quick, and and it was very good the way that the the the, the consultants that put it together. Um, but that's work that I know I don't know how to do all that stuff. Uh, maybe my community health person would know how to do that. But I think maybe just figuring out that last step to help tribes get that produced so that we can push it out. I think that would that would go a lot further. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Um, and I do want to thank you all again one more time for joining us. Um, I do believe we have come to the end of our time. Um, and I, again, want to thank you guys for joining us and attendees, thank you for watching. Um, I, we will be sending out an evaluation um, shortly, either later tonight or earlier tomorrow morning um, for this AMA. If you would please fill it out, it's very helpful to us. Um, and then I will also try to compi compile all of the links that we shared during this one and send them out to everyone. And again, probably by later tonight, sometime tomorrow. Um, I will get that to everyone. Um, and please, if you have any additional questions, comments, or concerns, um, feel free to reach out to me, reach out to NIHB at any time. Um, I just put my email address in the chat box if anyone needs it. Um, um, I think Courtney will be putting the link to the evaluation in the chat box as well, if you guys wanna do it that way. Um, so we have just a couple of seconds until we do that and I have everyone sign off. Um, but I will say thank you all again one more time and please stay safe. Um, if you would like to fill out that uh, evaluation now, it is available in the chat box. Thank you.